Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safe here with Anthony Broom and Chris Ballas drinking a beer on the pod. What do we got? What do we got? We got Miller Light. Had to sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do and to be a do a podcast here at Aubrey's my favorite chain here in Dexter. Uh you have to, you know what, you have to buy a beer. So I bought a beer. I love so, it. I think, the, I think the last time that there was a beer consumed in this podcast feed was Ryan Van Bergen after the 2021 Ohio State game. So nice. We yeah. have a tradition of of podcast beers after some sort of win over Ohio State. Well, Tony Alford, let's start. Yeah, the perfect true. way to start. What a segue. This is the celebration <laughs> for that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we're going to get into quite a bit Michigan football and basketball. Uh, we will, uh, yeah, break it all down. Lots of news in the last few days. So we'll talk about that. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like the video, hit that thumbs up button. If you're excited about Michigan stealing Tony Alford, running backs coach and run game coordinator away from arch rival Ohio State, subscribe to our channel. And as always, head to the Wolverine.com, use the promo code UM1. It's an exclusive offer for podcast listeners and YouTube viewers. It gets you two months of premium access for just $1. And this is the perfect time to get in right now. Potential coaching change in basketball, either way, whether Jawan Howard's retained or uh, is let go. There's going to be a lot of intel coming your way at the Wolverine.com. All sorts of stuff going on with spring ball starting as well on the football side of things. So make sure to take advantage. Uh, but let's get into it. Tony Alford, you know, we we alluded to this possibility without naming any names during Monday's show, the splash hire, you know, that that we kind of talked about. And it happened. It's certainly a splash hire. It sent shockwaves through college football, you know, Michigan. Ohio State, you do two things. One, you better yourself. You get a good running backs coach in Tony Alford, who was with the Buckeyes for nine seasons, Notre Dame before that. You also steal him away from your bitter rival two practices into spring ball. He'd been on the field working with the Ohio State offense. He was the assistant head coach for the offense. He was the running backs coach as well for nine seasons. And uh, now he's in Ann Arbor getting ready for another spring ball, which starts on Monday. I like it. Um, you know what? When we first heard the name, and I want to credit our recruiting guys for being the ones yep. to bring it to us initially, uh, Zach and EJ, and they said, hey, uh, we'd heard that he interviewed. And it's like, wow. Well, we knew there was interest when we followed up, but it was really, really hush-hush, and you can now you can see why, right? I think we had a guy on our uh, message board, Big Blue Coach, saying, oh, it's bullshit, and we're never going to hear the real story and the real name, blah, 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 blah. Well, here you go, big blue coach. Not only are you hearing the name, but you're hearing the hire here, and it's a big one. So uh, Tony Alford's been around for a long time. Heard from a lot of Ohio State guys that, hey, you don't listen to the fan base. This one kind of came out of nowhere, and it is a loss. There's no question in their minds. Everybody's like, well, he couldn't recruit. And I go back and look at all the guys that they have recruited, and he has recruited, and what he's done with them. This is a good football coach. So exciting. And now we're going to find out where the bodies are buried in Columbus, right? Uh, Who hired the private investigators? And we get to know everything about the ins and outs of the Ohio State offense and where they're soft and – uh, bring it on, Tony. We're going to have him on this podcast next Monday. I'm just kidding, but wouldn't that be great if he came on and just spilled it all? We I can try. Manifest it. We can, you can always try. It never hurts to ask. So, But welcome aboard, Tony, and uh, can't wait to see you get going. Yeah, and I wrote about this too. Like, Let's get one thing straight right off the bat. Like, I'm not a believer in home run hires, uh, and maybe it's semantics, but I am a believer in the best hire you can possibly make. And you know, when you lose a guy like Mike Hart, who for what my money's worth, is maybe the best developer of talent at that position in the country, at least with what he, we saw him do at Michigan over the last few years with Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards, Hassan Haskins. The names go on and on. Um, you know, when you lose a guy like that, it, do, it is a blow. But the only thing that matters is what happens next. And, you know, take the ramifications of the school that it came from are, you know, that's an entirely, it's not a different storyline. I mean, it's a huge pull in that regard, but, um, you know, to me, this is the best possible hire that Sharon Moore could have made. And Buckeye people will tell you that, or at least some of their crazy fans on Twitter will say, oh, well, he was a lame duck anyways. Listen, if he was such a terrible coach, not only, I mean, I know he didn't get an extension from Ryan Day, but they let him be part of planning for spring ball and then starting to coach spring ball. Um, you know, he was going to lead a room of, of Trevion Henderson and, and Quinshawn Judkins, which on paper, which Ohio State – tends to win a lot of championships on paper lately. I uh, had a chance to be the best. It still has a chance to be the best duo in college football, but um, 
again, you know, if they were so displeased with his performance, why was he brought back? Why was he still coaching spring ball? Uh, it's a huge win. It's a big splash hire. Again, and it's another thing we talked about where, you know, you're not just going to slide in and replace everything that went well about the Jim Harbaugh era. You can make great hires and they might look a little bit different. I think the recruiting will certainly be better at running back. Um, you know, he's coached four 1,000 yard rushers. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott's one of them. Mike Weber's one of them. Uh, J.K. Dobbins for three years, I believe, and then uh, Henderson. So, this guy has a track record, and and it really, I think, it rounds out this offensive staff in, in a in a great way. Uh, given that that running back room is is going to be a pretty big part in setting the tone and setting the identity of what this thing looks like moving forward. And I love the response, Jordan Marshall, uh, talking about him and saying what a great hire. Uh, we've heard good things from inside the building about the response to the hire. So, hey, come on, Tony, uh, coach these guys up because Sharon Moore still wants to smash with the running game, right? And I think you're going to see that. I think this offensive line is going to be pretty good. I think the running backs are good. Uh, let's see what you can do with Donovan Edwards, man, and uh, get the best out of him consistently. Uh, there's a chance for this offense to be really good if they find a quarterback. So a lot of pieces that have to fit together, but this defense is going to carry the day for a while. But Tony Alford, I think is going to do a great job with those backs. I got a trivia question. The rest of the Michigan offensive staff minus Tony Alford, how many years of FBS coaching experience do those four gentlemen have? Not counting Tony Alford. Uh, probably four. <laughs> 13. Gosh. Okay. Is the answer. Sorry, oh, who, who did I miss? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Bellamy, Kurt, Kurt Campbell, right? Yep. Um, and then Granite Newsom, um, who I guess he did have three. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I was thinking of this, of this as his first year as a position coach, but obviously he's been coaching tight ends too. And then so, Steve Casula. Yeah. Right. And Casula I missed as well. So, well, Tony but, Alford has 29, is, right. is my point. And, yep. you know, so he brings a lot of experience to this staff for as much as we say, Hey, it's a first year head coach. You know, you can even extend this to the, the strength and conditioning department where you have a first year, um, you know, strength coach there who was at Michigan, but not necessarily running the strength department. He adds a lot of experience. He has a ton of ties in the recruiting world um, as well. He's from Akron. He's done a good job recruiting Ohio. He's done a good job, not just with running backs, but when you read, you know, from our EJ Holland over at the Wolverine.com, what he's done on the trail outside of the running back position too, just in the Midwest in general, it's been really positive. So he brings that along with what he's developed and, you know, reading EJ's article with the, the five big biggest uh, recruiting wins that he's had, Travion Henderson, JK Dobbins being the top two. I mean, that's impressive right there. Now, it's hard to separate between, you know, is Ohio State just going to get those recruits anyway? Is it more just up to the assistant coach to not screw it up? Maybe, you know, to a certain extent, especially in the NIL era. But it's pretty clear he's done a good job there. He's He was there for nine years. He was there under Urban Meyer. He was, you know, retained by Ryan Day. So I think it's a, a very good hire. And like any of these, we'll see how it comes together. But it seems like, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty positive one and you know when you look at Mike Hart leaving, there's always that shock when an assistant coach leaves. Mm. But when you make a hire several days later and it's this one uh, that that looks this good, I think Michigan fans feel pretty good right now after uh, after this. And all you have um, to do is go back and look at the articles, guys, that they've written about this guy over the last nine years and how good he was. And you know you can't hide what you wrote and put out there. Now all of a sudden he's oh he didn't recruit and he didn't get all these guys and so on and so forth and. Uh, you know what? And, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was on the out with, you know, maybe he doesn't see eye to eye with Ryan Day, whatever. Uh, I don't really care. I know that he's had success in the past. Uh, he seems like a, a guy that's not going to take any crap. Looking at his Twitter feed and responses to some articles that were put out there that were apparently inaccurate um, and calling them out. Uh, I like that. I like the fact that he's setting the record straight. So uh, to me, this guy, you know what? is uh looks like a great fit and and again uh anytime you get a you poach a coach from ohio state who's had the kind of success he's had there uh, it's fantastic now he hasn't realized success in this rivalry recently but sometimes that's why guys move right if you can't beat them join them <laughs> well and something i something i push back on too is you know the idea that he was just keeping a seat warm and they're going to get those recruits regardless well one he was there for nine years and two before that he spent six years at notre dame under brian kelly so this has been a guy who's been a key assistant on a few, and I know 
there might be Michigan fans that push back on this. A few of the peer quote unquote institutions, at least in terms of who you measure, who you measure yourself against, who you compete with on the recruiting trail, athletically um, anyway. Yeah, athletically on the field, uh, off the field, other discussions to be had there. But this is a good hire, uh, not just a good hire; it's a great hire. Like I said before, I think it's the best hire that they could have made. Um, you know, to me, I think that it's going to be a shot in the arm. It's going to be something a little bit different. And I like that there's that experience there because now you look at this offensive staff as a whole, because it is the totality of it with that staff being complete. You've got an experienced play caller in, in Sharon Moore, who's your head coach now. Kirk Campbell, I think, is an up-and-comer and will do a fine job. Did a really nice job with the quarterbacks last year, even outside of J.J. McCarthy, getting some of those guys ready. Uh, Grant Newsom's a rising star in this industry. As I said before the other night, I think Ron Bellamy uh, doesn't get enough credit for the job he's done. And uh, Steve Casula is another guy with offensive coordinator experience that kind of came up through the Michigan ranks. So I like how he rounds out this staff. And again, it's, uh, you know, we, we tell people to wait until everything is finished and finalized. And for a while there, I get it. You know, within the span of a couple of weeks, Harbaugh's gone. Ben Herbert's gone. All of these guys you're familiar with are gone. That's why you let the process play itself out. You let them get to spring football and see what it looks like. And I think they have the bones of a pretty good operation here moving forward. Yeah, and the operation on the defensive side, which we can talk about now, will be run by Wink Martindale, uh, who we will also talk to tomorrow, as well as Kirk Campbell. So a little bit of access there. So, again, stay tuned at the Wolverine for that, They're doing a uh, pre-spring ball press conference. But he also joined John Jansen on his podcast this week and, you know, shed a little bit of light into leaving the NFL after 20 years, coming to Michigan uh, what the system's going to look like. And he said that one of the first things he told the players to reassure them that they're in good hands here is that, hey, in all humility, I'm the OG of this system. And he was the coordinator when Jesse Minter and Mike McDonald were position coaches there in Baltimore, ran that defense for four years, goes and runs the New York Giants defense for two seasons, leaves and is now back in college. He said this is a bucket list type of thing, a dream job to be the defensive coordinator at Michigan, and he's comfortable coming back to college after all those seasons in the NFL, which is kind of amazing given the state of college athletics right now. But he returns a lot of talent, and one of the most interesting comments I thought he made when talking to John Jansen was about you know, he loves he loves Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, what he has returning on the defensive side. He named other guys, Josiah Stewart, D. Moore. He's already got nicknames for everybody. Uh, he was calling Ernest Hausman Ernie, so that he's Ernie now. Like to me, that's you know he's Ernie. Works for me, um, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> But he likes the talent. He said, hey, th these players, I told him, come on into the staff meetings. Come on in and listen to what we're talking about, what we're planning. Um, and, you know, I kind of like how he's embraced and, and come in. And he, he said he loves going to the basketball, hockey, soft. He can't wait for softball and baseball. Like, he's embraced being a college coach, and I think that's important. I agree. Uh, I wonder how much he's going to recruit. You know, we've heard some yes. things about that. And, uh, you know, I don't think the, the former coordinators recruited a whole heck of a lot, to be honest with you. I think a lot of it was other guys. And, um, but boy, did they ever put a team together? If you look at the 18 guys that they sent to the combine and Wink Martindale, uh, he's got an ego like all these coaches do. Uh, he's got a strong will like a lot of these coaches do. So, but it's, there's no question that he's the unequivocal leader of this defense now. Right. And, you had guys there before that were kind of in co-coordinator positions. He's the guy. So follow his lead. Let's see what he can do. Hopefully hopefully he's not over aggressive because you've proven that the way to beat the Ohio States and teams like that, the Washingtons, is to you don't have to blitz all the time. You just have to confuse them and uh, and basically play good, solid, fundamental defense and tackle well. So I like the hire. Uh, we'll see how it translates. It's been a long, long time, but there's no question the guy knows football, right? So one thing about a great football team is that the staff really has to mesh, and that's what we've seen with the Michigan guys the last few years. Uh, hopefully that'll still be the case here because that's going to be important. Uh, you've seen what happens on the basketball side if you've got a culture problem and, and guys don't get along. Uh, once John Sanderson left, that thing went in the tank for uh, Jawan Howard and Michigan basketball. Uh, I anticipate these guys will get along well. Uh, under Sharon Moore's guidance, uh, Sharon Moore, again, never heard anybody say a bad word about this guy. So feel pretty good about the direction uh, here in this first year. They got a lot of talent, guys. The second year is going to be the one where everybody's like, okay, uh, how well do these guys coach? Because they're going to be losing a lot more talent too. But to me, this first year, there's a real opportunity here to get it off on the right foot.
Well, the thing too that made Michigan so successful on defense under Mike McDonald and under Jesse Minter was the fact that uh, Martindale even mentioned this. You know, when you watch Michigan on film, all those guys play with great technique and they come right at you. It just kind of when you have guys that are that disciplined and that are that well taught, all you have to do is call the defense. And and I think that that's going to be a huge key with some of these new hires on deep. You know, on that side of the ball, you know, Greg Scruggs, Brian Jean Marie, Lamar Morgan. You know, how fundamentally sound will their position groups be um, and how much does that take off of Wink Martindale's plate? How much, you know, is his successor currently on the staff? That's something that I think a lot of us will be watching and paying attention to. Um, you know, for me, it's, he's right. You know, in a lot of ways, he is the OG of the system that Michigan ran. And we know we've talked about some of the differences between his style and, and Minter's style and McDonald's style. Um, so you hope that, you know, if there is some sort of, you know, that he doesn't get too bullheaded and just kind of yell, well, I'm the manufacturer of this defense and what I say goes. I think there's going to be a, a lot more pliability than that. I think it's important, too, that it sounds like Sharon Moore is going to help set that identity of what they want to be on that side of the ball, which a head coach needs to do. He's not just going to hand the entire thing off to Wink Martindale and say, here you go. It's his program. He sets the tone. Uh, I think that, again, when you look at, what they've done on both sides of the ball with the staff. Again, I know it's almost wholesale changes. It is wholesale changes uh, on the defensive side of the ball, but man, oh man, with the players they have coming back with the, you know, the teachers of the game with some of the up and comers that they have, I really do think that that, uh, that defense has a chance to be maybe not quite as good as it was because uh, that was a special defense that helped them win a national title, but there's a lot of pieces there and a lot to be excited about. No doubt. Well, another comment that stood out to me was a half-joking Wink Martindale saying, I wish we had a little bit easier schedule than what we have, but I guess it's something I'm used to from where I just came from, referencing the NFL. And to me, you know, I, I think what you have to do as an NFL defensive coordinator, where every single week it's a different challenge, it's a, you know, a lot of great quarterbacks and you know, different styles of play from week to week, but they're all very good. I mean, these are great players you're going against going into this you know next season where you do have a really challenging schedule i think having somebody from the nfl and it would have been more ideal to have jesse minter in charge of this defense but having somebody that had to do that on a week-to-week -week basis you know is not necessarily a, a bad thing either uh so i think he'll be able to challenge it and then the last thing that stood out was he was at the 1995 michigan ohio state game he said the tim biaka batuka game and he said he was sitting on the 50 yard line the dufex were we're hosting him, and he said it was amazing. You watch, you look on the field, and you see so much talent in scarlet and gray, but somehow it was Michigan that was just mauling them up front, and the running back was going wild, and they were able to win that game and upset number two, Ohio State. And, you know, part of the 90s is, you know, the mental edge that Michigan had over Ohio State. It feels similar now, and I think he, he understands the dynamic. You know, maybe, you know, I'm sure he's watched other Michigan-Ohio State games, but that's a good game for Wink Martindale to have been at, I think. Now that it's 20, you know, whatever years later. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it, were, it you there, were, you, were you alive, Clay, back in the day? I was not. Uh, when they when Timby Akapatuka ran crazy in Ohio State? I was not. I think, are you cutting in and out here? Probably. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep, we got you. All right. No, I think that... Um, yeah, that was one of the best football games I've ever seen by an individual performance in that game. Uh, it was fantastic. And um, and you were absolutely right, though, about the mindset back then. Uh, they came in there with their butts, cl butts clenched, uh, Ohio State did, even when they had more talent than Michigan. And you could tell that Michigan had the mental edge in the series, and I think we're there again. Now uh, Ohio State has gone all in with the money, right? Um, it's almost like the Dallas Cowboys, right? We'll give you everything you need. You're going to pay and, and pay and pay some more, and you better win something. Uh, that seems what the, to be what they've done with the Ryan Day here. If Michigan finds a quarterback, guys, uh, they're going to go in there with a lot of confidence and an outstanding defense, assuming they same, stay healthy. And uh, that could be a lot of fun again. Uh, we are not conceding any game on the schedule. I've already gone on record as saying if Michigan has a solid quarterback, they're going to beat Texas. Uh, they're going to have a very good year, and I think they're going to make the playoff. Uh, I would not go down there and concede that Michigan's going to lose to Ohio State this year just because they bought a bunch of players and you know feel like they're better now. Uh, I think in the trenches, Michigan could has the potential to be better. Uh, we'll see what the offensive line does, but I trust Sharon Moore and Grant Newsom to do some really good things there. 
Um, I, I can't wait. Uh, I got to tell you, it has really rejuvenated. It really rejuvenates you when you win a championship and you come back and uh, you can't wait for that next Michigan football game again, right? We saw 15 of them and it was some, in some ways the longest years of our lives covering scandals and everything else. But it makes it leaves you wanting more, and I can't wait to see some of these new guys. We're talking about the linebackers. I think the linebacker duo of, of Ernie and uh, Jay Sean Barham is going to be really, really good, and uh, that defensive line is going to be dominant at, uh, for the most part, uh, especially on the interior. And then you've got an elite corner in Will Johnson and an elite safety in Rod Moore. Guys, uh, let's get this thing going. It's going to be fun. It's Ernie, it just cracks me up. Like Ernie. he's a Muppet or something. They're gonna call Bert um, and Ernie. They're gonna call him Bert and Ernie on the inside. Jay Sean's nickname is gonna be Bert. Yeah. That's Sesame Street for you, young kids, year old guys. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have much to have there. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I think they're in about as good a place you can be after everything that happened. You know, the first six weeks of the off season and all the change. They're they're in a pretty stable place, and now you could actually practice ball and evaluate what you have. And um, I think one of the, you know, I wrote about this in a mailbag that I did earlier today over on the website is, you know, the one of the benefits of starting spring football later than everyone else is, is that, you know, not only are you going to see some of these position battles play out nationally, um, it gives Michigan a chance to, you know, evaluate their guys, maybe just a smidge longer, not that their spring ball is any longer, but that the, the transfer portal window is going to open with about five days left still in Michigan spring camp. So they're going to know uh, when that portal opens, what they need and what other, what might be available to them. So uh, I think that's a, that's a good place to be in uh, at this time. And we may know who's planning on entering the portal based on maybe some guys sitting out the spring game. It's going to be kind of interesting in that little window there. Um, let's talk about our, commemorative issue of the Wolverine magazine, which you can get over at the Wolverine on demand.com special national championship edition. I got the book version here, which you can purchase. There's also the magazine version. I believe Anthony's holding up one of each right there uh, for the people watching on YouTube. So it's in the description of the video and the podcast. It's also at the Wolverine on demand.com over 140 pages of content. Looking back at Michigan's 15 and 0 2023 national championship season so get your copy today pre-orders went out but you can still order we still have inventory in at the website uh, at the wolverine on demand.com you can see it up on the screen right there so get your copy of either the book or the magazine again the link is in the description or at the wolverine on demand.com let's talk about basketball in a second uh but first just quickly touch on quentin johnson being officially back in the michigan secondary and we talked about it on monday and then it you know you know, a couple hours later, he's officially back. He's posing in front of a Mercedes as well. Uh, you know, he got a new NIL deal, and it sounds like Champion Circle uh, has done a good job, you know, helping him uh, come back in the fold for Michigan after initially on February 2nd declaring for the NFL draft. But this is a guy who made huge plays last season, fumble recovery against uh, Ohio – or uh, excuse me, against Alabama, the pass breakup, huge hit against Ohio State, but he had 22 tackles, one pick, five pass breakups. Um, he also played 323 defensive snaps. That was fourth among safeties behind Rod Moore, Makari Page, and Keon Sab. But with Sab gone, you needed that depth there. And now they have a little, you know, a little bit more flexibility for what they can do in the secondary. How many did they how many did Sab have? Uh let me look here yep. right now. Clay Sab had Sab had 360. So, okay, uh, so you, it's basically negligible, right? And right. Keon Sab made some big plays, Minnesota interception. I remember, remember the Quinton Johnson interception? I think it was against Bowling Green. It was where he's tap, yeah. tip tap, tiptoeing the sideline and stuff like that. Look at that hit. It uh, brings a tear to my eye. Uh, Swanky Wolverine had a nice uh, meme on that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, as well. But uh, you know what I said a week ago, and we said a, a couple weeks ago that, that Quinton was looking at coming back. We talked to people in the know and they said yes it is definitely a possibility and now here we are uh to me it's negligible the difference between him and keon sab with the exception that you know everybody's going to say well keon sab is younger guess what keon sab is going to be in the nfl next year if he has the kind of year that he hopes to have it at uh, alabama anyway right going to be a junior so i think he would go and i like this to me it's tit for tat uh, I, I like keon sab a lot but getting quentin johnson back pretty much negates his loss 
in my opinion. So, man, does that remind me of the uh, Marcus Ray hit right there and the 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 uh, the take that cover from the yes 1997 Michigan Ohio State game. So, um, I, I like this kid, and I like the fact that you get some more leadership coming back because we've been talking about who are the captains on this team. I talked to Mason Graham yesterday for an article. He's a soft spoken guy. I think he's a leader in the weight room and overall. He's a junior, though. Uh, there's the kid that forced the fumble against uh, Jalen Milrow that uh, the waiter in Indianapolis called out and uh, recognized him for. So, um, But I, I think that was a great move. Um, happy to have him back. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he's a captain next year. And re real quick on the snap counts, too. In the Alabama game, uh, Quentin Johnson plays 35 snaps, Keon Sab with five. So he had kind of passed him up. At that point in the season, maybe it was opponent dependent. The next week, Quinton was hurt. Keon played 61 in the national title and played really well. But yes, it was it was pretty much a wash between who was the third safety there. I mean, yeah, it's it's huge. Um, and again, people, there's been some confusion about well, he declared for the NFL draft, but he can come back. Like first, first of all, he's an upperclassman, so it's usually the paperwork you submit as an underclassman uh, to submit or to get into the draft, and also didn't go through any. All star games wasn't invited to the combine, uh, so and had the eligibility left, so that's why he's back. But yeah, I think it rounds out that you know, we know Michigan likes to play three safeties, uh, quite a bit, so I think that that rounds out that rotation fairly well. I think it gives you some options, uh, in terms of some of the combinations and, and some of the, the competition there will be for snaps, certainly, um, in multiple spots. There, we know that they're gonna have a battle at number two cornerback again. They're going to have a battle for that nickel job uh, left behind by Mike Sainer still. So, you know, just having another veteran body back there um, is is so critical. And again, it it just continues to raise the floor of what we think that defense can be, and um, or at least establish the floor of what we know it can be. And we'll see which direction it goes. But uh, great, great, uh, great news to have him back. No doubt. Um, let's move on to Michigan basketball. Their season ending. Wednesday night in the Big Ten tournament, they end with nine straight losses, eight and 24 overall. The losingest season in Michigan basketball history, lose last night to Penn State. Jawan Howard grilled a little bit in the postgame press conference. Uh, and, you know, I'll read off a couple of his comments here, but he says basically his answer hasn't changed about his desire to come back to Michigan, coach there next season. He said, We'll go home, sit down and meet me and the players. Then I'm sure the athletic department will want to sit down and talk. I'm looking forward to having those type of conversations. He was asked to make his pitch, which I thought was an interesting question. Um, and, and he didn't really want to make his pitch, nor, nor does he have to uh, publicly. But talked about the adversity that Michigan has faced, including losing Jet Howard, Kobe Bufkin, Hunter Dickinson, the injuries, the Doug situation. I know a lot of that is self-inflicted. He didn't mention the John Sanderson situation, which certainly qualifies as something that, you know, maybe adversity for the players uh, that was self-inflicted as well but uh yeah your guys thoughts with the season coming to a close and Jawan howard uh talking after the game last night uh man uh this i've never been more disinterested in a michigan basketball season watching these guys play and i know that's harsh um but to me uh there was so much the guys just didn't, didn't give a damn right uh there was so much i don't give a damn on the floor this year and guys going through the motions and you know so i thought some of his comments about putting it on the giving it all on their floor every night um you know what disingenuous in my opinion because he has even acknowledged this year at times that they just weren't giving enough so i think this is uh that was the last game that Jawan Co howard coached at michigan we're going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of days but um to me i you know we hoped it would be a good thing um, I had my doubts going into it because he'd never been a head coach, never put together a roster. And basically, and frankly, that was his biggest failure at Michigan was, and, and not all his fault, uh, with NIL and everything else. It's a, it's a game changer, but you need a veteran in that position and somebody that knows how to construct a roster and knows people. Um, you know, John Beeline, for example, doesn't get Muhammad Ab Abdul, Muhammad Ali, Abdur Rock, right? Exactly. Uh, Muhammad Ali, Abdur Rockman. If he doesn't know somebody who calls him up and says, hey, 
I got a player for you to watch. Not saying that Jawan Howard doesn't have that and, and have those sources, but uh, in Chicago, it is really, really hard to land those guys. So um, overall, I am very, very grateful that this season is over. First time we've ever missed a Big Ten tournament basketball game. We weren't going to go up to Minneapolis to watch them play and lose to Penn State for the second time this year. Um, frankly, it's embarrassing. It needs to end. I believe it will end. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things to where, you know, it's I don't I won't even say it's piling on. It's just a lot of things that we've discussed already. Um, the one thing that bothers me is over the last few weeks, it seems like there's been this all of a sudden the narrative has kind of been, oh, well, I'm proud of these guys for the effort they put forth and, and what they fought through this year. When a couple of weeks ago, Jawan Howard publicly, you know, in a press conference, called out their effort, called out their buy and said that, oh, maybe I should play the walk ons a little more. The fact of the matter is this, is that they end the season 8-24. and 24, They lost 19 of their last 21 games. And of those 19 losses, only six of them were by single digits, one of them being last night, thanks to Jackson Silvala, who, oddly enough, I wrote something on him for the next magazine that comes out. So how do you like that for, uh, for poetry? But, <laughs> you know, I think that, and I tweeted this last night, you know, Michigan's issues this year, aren't something that's a one-year vacuum. You know, it's not just bad luck with Doug McDaniel. It's not just the heart surgery, which, again, extremely sympathetic to that, like um, times a million. Like, that is some, so hard to fight through, and I don't know that anyone would have faulted Juwan Howard if he sat out longer or sat out the season in general. But uh, So I give credit to him for fighting and seemingly, personally, working very hard to make sure he, get, he got back. But at the end of the day, uh, the issues that plagued them all year, which was – Lack of defensive aptitude, um, lack of effort, you know, offensive inconsistency, you know, bad shot selection, uh, the turnovers, all of these, all of these sort of fundamental things are things that we've started to see, you know, cracks that eroded into a bigger issue this year. And if you want to, you know, you can take, even though they made the sweet 16 a few years ago, like I'm not going to completely wipe out what happened there, but on the merits of even just the last two years, this has been completely and utterly unacceptable it has uh i think that they are selfish as a team i think they lack accountability uh their player development and roster building has been awful uh they don't you know the, the attention to detail stuff is just so lacking and even regresses as the season went on which to me is a lack of effort is a lack of buy-in or of buy-in and to me there's no there's no nuance within it there's no tough conversation to be had um I think it's pretty clear that a coaching change needs to take place. And at any other university, with any other athletic director, with any other leadership, this is a cut and dry thing that is is probably wrapped up already. Um, and I'm not saying it's not. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But uh, this is bad and demands wholesale change beyond just flipping some assistance and making some changes in the office. Like everything has to go. We kind of do know what's going on behind the scenes. And, and basically, uh, it, uh, they've kind of come to an agreement that uh, he has until Monday to um, to make this decision. So um, it's going to be fascinating to see. We will have more on this when it plays out. And, uh, you know, there are rumblings of a uh, an article coming out from one of our colleagues that uh, does not – really speak well to the the basketball program or the athletic department as a whole so be fascinating to watch fellows these next several days and i've been saying it these next few weeks are going to be big for michigan athletics yeah no doubt and, and things behind the scenes like that and the off-court issues that michigan has had you know just just makes it worse you know the eight and 24 but then you have all that going on it'd be one thing if there were some a couple off the court issues but you were winning right you can kind of push through that get through it It'd be one thing if there were no off the court issues and you were losing, you know, you could maybe say, okay, well, you know, at least everything else, the operations really good. We know that there's potential here. The recruiting operations good as well. There's a future, like look at Rutgers. They just finished a terrible season, but they have a good class coming in. So at least there's something that Steve Peichel has to look forward to in the future, but Michigan doesn't necessarily have that. And there's off the court stuff and they're losing on the court and they're going to lose about half the roster, which by the way, like I'm not saying that is, at it's least total detriment. Yeah. At, at least. least, um, you know, not some total detriment because the guys that are on the, that are on the roster just went eight and 24, but I'm mm -hmm. just showing that 
you, there's so much uncertainty regardless of who the coach is going to be. And it's going to be interesting too. Let's say they do move on from Jawan Howard here in the next couple of days, as a lot of people expect after an eight and 24 season one, the coaching carousel is going to be interesting. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about on Monday, but two, you know, you have to sell to a prospective coach what your vision is if you're ward manual or whoever's in charge of making that hire you know it comes out today i see a report from on three that louisville has three to four million dollars in their collective's payroll for next year's roster which we're just calling it a payroll now which is kind of funny how out in the open this stuff is but you know they got some money to work with if you're louisville uh does michigan have that type of support in the short term here in the next couple of days if you're going to be making a hire so there's a lot of complicated things with this and it is interesting if I, if you look at it from Jawan Howard's perspective too. It's like, man, I was just under for open heart surgery six months ago. You know, he certainly he said he turned the corner uh, health wise two weeks ago. You know, he's still dealing with some health stuff. Um, you know, and I understand if you're him, you're probably thinking, man, this this seems a little bit harsh if you were to be let go. But I mean, maybe if he was around the whole year, do they win a couple more games? Probably. Um, but it seems more like a coincidence that the health thing happened this year. Uh, with the losing than, you know, the the, uh, the result of the health situation, I think. Yeah, I can't. Again, if this had happened. I think Phil Martelli won more games than he did this year, didn't he? I don't know. Uh, Three and then, yeah, four. It's probably, when did he come back officially? It was Eastern Michigan. So, yeah, it was, it's four to. It's a uh, one, two, three, four, five. It is five, five. three, five to three. Five. Phil, but what but that I doesn't. I mean, it, it doesn't. Phil really also lost to Long Beach State. You me. know, so. <laughs> was that Juwan's first game back on the bench, Long Beach State? I thought it was Eastern. Uh, well, he he came back on the bench in Atlantis. So his yep. first game back on the bench was that Memphis game. But his first game back as head coach was the sixteenth, December sixteenth. Okay. against eastern michigan so yeah anyway yeah. regardless guys i'm just glad it's over i'm done talking michigan basketball this year until we have a coaching change which i fully expect no doubt so stay tuned at the wolverine.com for all of that it's going to be uh, a big few days here uh ward manual told reporters last night after the game that conversations with juan howard will be had in short order Decisions will be made soon, so we will see what that looks like in definition of soon. At Michigan, not always, uh, you know, not always lining up with the definition that others have in the the general public or their own workplaces. But that is neither here nor there. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like the video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. We greatly appreciate that. CB just gave the thumbs up there. Make sure to also click the thumbs up button. Don't just give a thumbs up at your laptop or phone. Uh, but but subscribe to our channel. Also subscribe to our YouTube feed, or uh, our podcast feed as well. And again, head to thewolverine.com. The promo code is UM1 for two months of premium access for just $1. This is a perfect time to get in all the inside intel and a CB said behind the scenes information as well. We'll see everybody next time.